Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Commissioner Tim Fincham and Bruce Broussard. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, obviously, our behavior is going to be changed after trying that lunch. That was pretty special. Uh, this week is a partnership of a number of different people, and I want to introduce to you one of those partners. We have together uh, the Clinton Foundation, and we thank again President Clinton for his uh, commitment to this partnership and the great work that his staff has done, which is really phenomenal. The, our title sponsor, Humana, uh, the Desert Charities Group, which has been a longtime partner of the PGA Tour here in the desert and putting on our tournament, the Bob Hope family in an effort to perpetuate uh, the role of Bob Hope uh, and his family in golf in the desert for many, many years, and uh, the PGA Tour, and of course, uh, looking at PGA Tour players who walk five miles five or six days a week or 25 or 30 miles every week. Uh, and Bob Hope, who walked virtually every day of his life and lived to be 100, there's a, there's a set of role models and another role model for what we're talking about uh, during the course of today. Uh, Humana, uh, and we, under, under our umbrella, all of our tournaments are organized for charity, and we use that under the umbrella of together anything's possible, and certainly that's the case here. But Humana, who believes in uh, uh, the concept of partnering for another cause, uh, saw the vision of taking this week and making it into something special and using it to reach out to people around the country and pull people together to impact the serious problems that we've been talking about. I know, as I said earlier on the panel, that from the perspective of the PGA Tour, They've been a tremendous partner for us outside of the tournament business, just in working with us to improve the healthy equation uh, for our employees. But I'm delighted to present to you the leader of Humana. And as I bring him up, I want to thank him. I want to thank Bruce again for his commitment and his partnership to make this a very special week. We're just getting started. We have a long way to go, but we're making great progress. Ladies and gentlemen, Humana's leader, please welcome Bruce Broussard. Well, I appreciate that, Tim, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining us. We, uh, we have a long week this week, and we're really looking forward to it. As, uh, as Tim was mentioning, our goal is, our, our dream is lifelong well-being, and I hope you see it expressed in everything we're doing, and uh, both here but also in the tournament as a whole. And our partnership with the Clinton Foundation, with PGA, and also uh, the charities here in the local valley demonstrate that. We. Uh, we started this partnership uh, uh, around the challenge, but it has extended much beyond that. Today, we're big, big believers in what you saw this morning around uh, childhood obesity and supporting that and all the things we do there. And we think it starts from not only uh, being preventative, but also the social fa fabric of the community as a whole. In addition, as we talk about our lifelong well-being, Humana's philosophy is, is how can we do good and, and still do, do business, and I think you'll see that in everything we do and the partnerships we establish going forward, and I hope you guys will see that. The challenge is a great example of that. We, uh, we try to have fun with our fitness, too. Uh, you'll see some programs like the Walk It, and if you guys are here over the next few days, you'll probably see a pedometer like this. We give that to every participant that is part of the challenge, and we have a, a little contest. The contest is around how many, how many steps you, you, you take, and we're big believers. In fact, our associates uh, have, wear pedometers all the time in our organization, and we try to in, instruct them and help them with 10,000 uh, steps a day. And that has really made an impact. Uh, last year, we get this statistic, 84 million steps were taken at the challenge last year. That's, that's a lot of wa walking. And um, the one thing that I think Tim and his and his organization does a great job on is the fact that this is one of the few sports, golf, that you can participate in 
and also exercise. It's not like eating chili dogs and nachos and sitting in the stands. You actually got to go out there and exercise and walk, and we, we really take a, a big pride in that aspect of that. A little story uh, that came across this weekend. We had a, a uh, senior uh, citizen that actually came up to our associate and said, you changed my life. Last year, I was part of the uh, Humana Walk It, uh, where you took the pedometer, and I also took my bi biometric screening at your uh, well tour. Uh, we have an 18-wheeler bu uh, 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 18 uh, bus, so to speak, that has all kinds of uh, uh, wellness, uh, 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 excuse me, monitoring in it. And she came by and said it, and I was appalled at my statistics. And she actually went out and started walking the whole um, year. And uh, this weekend in the, uh, our walking uh, event on Saturday, she came up and said, I am a new person. And I have actually lived that, that also. I, uh, about six years ago, lost about 50 pounds. And it has had a great impact, not only physically. I mean, obviously, I feel good physically, but mentally. And it is like what was talked about this morning. It's that simple stuff that makes a difference in our health care costs. And we at Humana not only are doing the complicated stuff around chronic care, but are also doing the simple stuff. A little statistics about the challenge. Last year, we were up 68% and. Uh, in, uh, mem in, in participation, we contributed about $2 million of charity, of which uh, Humana contributed about 500000 In addition, this is a neat, neat um, aspect. We won the sporting event of the year. And uh, someone said we even beat the Super Bowl. So that's pretty impressive there. Uh, but really, today is about action. And um, as the Clinton Foundation has stated many times, we can talk about it all we want, but we need to take action on this. And we have some big, big things to take action on around the healthcare side. And uh, they've made a commitment. I think their commitment is to affect uh, 25 million people on about a $100 million commitment. And I think each one of us as leaders in the organizations need to make, that, make a commitment to help uh, advance our, our healthcare cause. In that regard, I think Mike McAllister, our, our chairman of the board, made the comment this morning that we're committed to our senior memberships and offering our vitality program, which I know Tim's talked about a lot, and it really has an impact to every one of our members. In addition, we are also offering the healthy foods program that uh, was talked about on the stage today with Walmart and our partnership to 750,000 this coming year. So we are there. We're focused on prevention. We're also focused on um, uh, maintaining and restoring life there. So please enjoy the week. Uh, we hope that you guys will take it and maybe take some steps in improving your life and uh, let us know what we can do better next year. So thank you very much and have a great, great week. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Butner. Thank you. I'm actually going to start by admitting right up front that I cheated. I'm framing this puzzle of how to create healthy communities by telling you what I essentially did was to go to the back of the book, look for the key, look at all the answers, and simply apply those. For the past decade or so, uh, while you have all been doing useful and productive things with your lives, uh, I've been spending National Geographic's money uh, going to the five parts of the world where people live statistically longer, which is a proxy for health. Uh, we based our project on the Danish twin study that showed very convincingly that only about 30% of how long the average person lives is dictated by genes. The other 70% is dictated by lifestyle and environment. So uh, we found a cluster of 17 villages, 42,000 people in the highlands of Sardinia, where there are 10 times more male centenarians there than any place else in the world. Uh, we found the longest lived females on the planet, the southernmost extreme of Japan, the islands of Okinawa, where women incidentally suffer about a fifth the rate of breast cancer. And last fall, I profiled for the New York Times magazine a tiny island off the coast of Turkey, a Greek island called Ikaria where a population of 10,000 uh, has the world's lowest rate of middle age mortality. They suffer a rate of heart disease about half that of what we do in America, and they have about one-fifth the rate of dementia. If you hit 85 in this country, there's a 50% chance you'll be suffering from dementia. 
these cultures, these blue zones as we call them incidentally, are heterogeneous populations. In other words, they are a melting pot. So over the course of uh, 10 years, I brought teams of experts to each of these places, and we tried to distill out what is correlating with longevity. What are the common denominators in all these five places that seem to explain extraordinary health and longevity? And we found nine of them. And I write a lot about those, but I'm going to jump right to the bottom line. The big aha in talking to centenarians and working with centenarian programs around the world, that 100-year-olds really have no idea how they got to be 100. If you ask them how they got to be 100, they might tell you it's the water or it's the wine or great sex. Yes, there is sex after 100. But they no more know how they got to be 100 than how a tall man got to be tall. The fact of the matter is longevity happened to them. They live in environments uh, that nudge them into constant physical activity. They want to go to the store, to their friend's house, they walk. Their houses are deconvenienced. There's not a button to push for yard work, another button to push for housework. They're constantly moving. They tend to have gardens. When it comes to food, healthy food is the most accessible, the cheapest. Their kitchens are set up so it's easy to make, and they have time-honored recipes that make it easy to, to, to make them taste good. Nobody's ever alone. We don't think of this much when we think about health. But actually, in America, if you meet the technical definition of loneliness, your life expectancy is eight years less than if you have five good friends around you. You go to Ikaria, Greece, nobody's ever alone. You don't show up to the festival, your neighbors are at your front door pounding on your door getting you to come out. They have vocabulary for purpose. The two most dangerous years in your life are the years you're born and the year you retire threefold spike in mortality. When you can define your purpose, when you know it instinctively, you don't have that spike in mortality. So based on that aha, that longevity happened to these people, essentially it's in their environment. They're not trying. They're not trying to change their behavior. Um, we try to do it in America. And you may say, well, sure, you found longevity on exotic little island in Asia or the Mediterranean. It's not America. Well, today we've been working in 13 cities, in in including the entire state of Iowa. In 2008, we teamed up with AARP and the University of Minnesota School of Public Health with this idea that instead of trying to hammer on individual behaviors, we would try to optimize the environment. We auditioned five cities, and we picked one, Albert Lee, Minnesota. And we essentially just helped them go through a number of exercises in thinking about their environment. We gave them a new lens. When thinking about their policies, all of us incidentally, or most Americans live within about 10 miles of their home and workplace. So how do you optimize that? Uh, do you live in a place where it's easy to smoke indoors and outdoors? Do taxes and subsidies favor vegetables or do they favor soda pop or as Barbara Streisand was saying, uh, potato chips? Uh, do you live in a place where the economic lifeblood focuses to a vibrant social center, or does it sprawl out to a suburban wasteland? Make a big difference. Built environment is the active option the easy option. Just cleaning up parks, cleaning up graffiti so it seems safe, fixing sidewalks, creating bike lanes. You can raise the activity level of an entire population by 30%, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. No gym memberships. You don't have to give them incentives at work. You don't even have to give them the t-shirt. Just make the active option the easy option. Social networks. Do you know that if your three best friends are obese, there's a 150% better chance that you'll be overweight. So calling through and finding the people who want to change their behaviors and then connect them with other people. And we know now from doing this 13 times that we have about a 60% success rate, that when you find two people who want to change their healthy behaviors, they become friends. When it comes to longevity, incidentally, there's no short-term fix. You've got to be thinking permanent or semi-permanent. Building designs, a huge opportunity. We found 110 building designs in schools, grocery stores, restaurants, even your home that put in nudges and defaults. So you move just a little bit more, eat a little bit less, Socialized just a little bit more. America got obese at 200 
calories a day. We're going to reverse that to 200 calories a day. The city of Albert Lee, after just one year, we saw their city workers' health care costs go down by 40%, and the average person gained 3.2 years of life expectancy. Uh, based on that success, the beach cities of California, Susan Burden and Lisa Santora are in the audience right now. If you get a chance, you should meet them. Amazing women. But they took on this idea to change the environment. And after two years, and this is according to Gallup, and it's against a control, by the way, representative sample of 98,000 adults uh, in their community. Uh, they brought down the rate of obesity by over 100%. They brought down the rate of smoking by over 100%. And they brought up the level of physical activity as measured by walking daily by over 700%. That was against a California control measured by Gallup. President Clinton did a fabulous job today as he always does, he's incandescent, uh, articulating the challenges, but I'm going to add two more. At current trends, 75% of Americans will be obese or overweight. 50% of us will be suffering from diabetes. And for the first time in living history, I've been following longevity. Since 1840, the human race has gained two years of life expectancy per decade. Since 1840. Now, for the first time in living history, life expectancy in our children is expected to drop by as much as five years. Our kids. Is that because we're stupid? Or we somehow don't possess the moral integrity of our forefathers? Or because we don't have good technology? No. What has happened is our environment has changed. We are genetically hardwired to live in an environment of hardship and scarcity, but we live in an environment of ease and abundance. You can't walk through a grocery store, walk through an airport, or fill up your car with gas, or go get cough syrup without being routed through a gauntlet of salty snacks or sugar sweetened beverages. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for choice. And discipline is a good thing. But discipline is a muscle, and muscles fatigue, and eventually after seeing that Snickers bar four times, you're going to grab it. Our great-grandparents burnt five times as many calories as we did engaged in physical activity. Raise your hand if you walked to school when you were a kid. Go ahead and raise your hand. The vast majority of hands are up, and we're in Southern California. Now raise your hand if your kids walk to school. I see about five hands. In 1970, over 50% of American kids have walked to school. We're now down to around 11%. Why have we engineered this physical activity out of our kids' lives? You know how much a policy that encourages walking kids to school cost? Zero. The answer to this puzzle of building healthy community lies, I will submit to you, with the populations that have achieved the health outcomes that we want. They're right there. There's at least five of them. And what they do is very simple and clear. The answer for America is to take a hard look at those populations and from it assemble a toolbox of tactics and strategies and then provide a lens for enlightened communities, like the community this panel coming up is, uh, represents, uh, for them to look at their community in a different way, look at optimizing that community. The secret to solving this pen pen puzzle, in, in a sense, is simply cheating. Thank you. The research exists on how to design our communities in ways that would allow us to live to 100. It takes a paradigm shift, political will, leadership, and a vibrant community. The area surrounding us, the Coachella Valley, has significant challenges, 
It's a community where the Clinton Health Matters Initiative is working with local partners on ways to improve the situation. Well, I'm very honored to, and, and so proud and happy that the Clinton Foundation Health Matters Initiative has chosen the Coachella Valley to be one of their sites to make the biggest impact. We have one of the worst healthcare crises in the state of California and possibly in the country, not only in the magnitude, but also in the disparities of health outcomes and healthcare access. More than 70% of kids in the Coachella Valley exist in poverty. Many people who live just 20 minutes from where you're sitting don't have access to clean water and reliable power. There are bright spots though, like Hidden Harvest. The local nonprofit rescues unwanted produce, providing a living wage for low-income farm workers and healthy food for those who need it. We hire the working poor to go into farmer's fields after harvest and the pay people, professional harvesters, to harvest what's left in the fields and then we give it all away. Over, we serve over 50,000 people a month, a million and a half pounds a year. The Coachella Valley has an opportunity to transform itself into a healthier place, a place where the playing field is leveled and all of its residents, even the most vulnerable, have access to a healthier life. You know, I was very fortunate to, to meet President Clinton and listen to him at his conference uh, about wellness, uh, about childhood obesity, um, which of course is one of the passions, but the overall uh, feeling of wellness in, in a community. And we, we took the challenge on. Uh, we created, of course, the first Palm Springs Health U um, uh, Race and Wellness Festival. And we've now moved it to a new level uh, to embrace uh, the Health Matters Initiative supported by the Clinton Foundation and the President. If we can improve the healthcare access for everybody, then not only in healthcare delivery, but also in health education, then we can make the Coachella Valley and the surrounding communities one of the healthiest communities uh, in, in the entire nation. And the Coachella Valley has the leadership and community spirit to make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kay Hazen. Well, welcome to all of you to our beautiful desert oasis. This is a panel and discussion about uh, local communities. We all love our desert home. We're surrounded by magnificent mountains, blessed with abundant natural resources, and year-round sunshine. Here, even when it rains, it's a dry rain. <laughs> the desert is ground zero for the development of renewable energy in solar and wind and geothermal. We're rich in agriculture too, and yet, as you heard from Chelsea Clinton earlier today, we're in the midst of a food desert. People flock here for our weather, our recreational opportunities, golf, hiking, tennis, world-class art and culture, and with all that, we're still, at our heart, a small local community. A, a distinct advantage when it comes to trying to make change. We're truly a land here in our desert of extremes. Our highs are high. Mount San Jacinto, second highest mountain in Southern California, where you climb 10,000 feet in just seven miles, the steepest escarpment in North America. And our lows are low. We're home to the Salton Sea, the largest lake in California at 378 square miles and 227 feet below sea level. Our nine cities rank among both the highest and the lowest in per capita income. And with these extremes come challenges, including significant health challenges and disparities, healthcare access issues, and health problems due to high levels of overweight and obesity. You'll be hearing more about the specifics of these challenges, problems, and some community-based solutions in just a few minutes. Our healthcare district 
and our nonprofit foundation started working in our local school district more than four years ago when we commissioned a major study on childhood obesity to find out the levels of seriousness in our neighborhood. In our community at that time, nearly one in every three students in grades five, seven, and nine were either overweight or obese. In some schools, more than half of all students were overweight. In grade nine, the data were more significant. In the last decade, we found the levels had risen more than 60% in 10 years. Clearly, the realization that we were raising a generation of XL children and our kids were becoming the first generation that might not live as long as their parents uh, spurred us into action at the local level. Schools we know are powerful places to shape health and well-being for students, staff, and families. Yet many don't have the financial or technical resources to build healthier learning environments. We began working in partnership with our local schools to fund nutrition ed education, breakfast programs, looking at strategies to reduce the levels of overweight and obesity to make the school environment healthier. We started a three-year project in Palm Springs with four schools, one a charter school. Then last year, like many of you, we came to the Health Matters Conference and were introduced to the Alliance for a Healthier Generation and the programs and the evaluation and the techniques and tools that they brought to the table. We were impressed. We asked ourselves, what if we broadened our reach from one school district, four schools, and we instead turned to our entire Coachella Valley three school districts, 92 schools, 71,000 students, all at once. We asked the Alliance for a Healthier Generation if they'd partner with us to try and make that happen. And here we are a year later, we did. Our funding, our Desert Healthcare District and Foundation funding supports a full-time Healthy Schools Relationship Manager for the Coachella Valley and over the course of the next four years, uh, the programs will be instituted and implemented in every school for every student throughout the Coachella Valley. This is the first time that this opportunity for the Alliance to address every school within a confined specific geographic uh, region has been put to the test. But in a very short period of time, less than a year, we're well on our way. Today, every school board in our valley has already signed on and committed to make important policy changes and implement the program. Every school has agreed to develop a wellness council and engage students, faculty, and parents in making positive and lasting change to instill a healthy environment and healthy behaviors in our kids, in our schools, in our homes. And we're measuring results, importantly. We're so grateful to President Clinton, to the Clinton Foundation, the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, and the Health Matters Initiative for providing the inspiration and support to take action. That is our pledge, to put the Alliance program in every school, in every district, all schools, every student throughout our valley, and to work together with our partners to make behavior change, to make policy change, and to make system change that will reduce the number of overweight and obese children and families in our valley and the associated health problems that come with it. Together, we'll move the needle in a positive and healthy direction toward wellness, and we're pleased and proud today to pledge our continuing support to make the desert ground zero for activating wellness in every generation. We are all in. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Carolyn Caldwell and the panelists. Good afternoon, thank you, and welcome to the Coachella Valley.
Desert Regional Medical Center is pleased to return as a sponsor for the second year of the Clinton Health Matters Conference. Desert Regional is committed to advancing the healthcare status of the communities we serve. We recognize that a comprehensive approach to healthcare requires collaboration. That's why, in addition to tenants' sponsorship of this conference, our hospital has pledged an additional 25,000 to join the mayor and the city of Palm Springs in the Health Planet Healthy You fundraiser, which I know the mayor will tell you more about in this session. The proceeds from that conference will go to support the collaborative efforts of the Clinton Health Matters initiatives in the Coachella Valley. At this time, I would like to ask a polling question so that we can get the audience involved in our panel discussion. More than a, what million Americans go without health value preventive services uh, for health care? So please take out your smartphones and answer the questions during the, this session. And before we turn it over to the question and answer session, uh, I will come back with the answers to that question. Thank you. I would like to introduce the panel and then we will get started. First, Dr. Glenn Grayman. Dr. Grayman is an emergency room physician and the former medical director of the Richards Emergency Trauma Center at Desert Regional Medical Center. Dr. Grayman is the president of the board of directors for the Desert Healthcare District. He is also the board of directors for HARC, the Health Assessment Resource Center in Palm Desert, California. The mission of HARC is to survey the community and identify healthcare issues. And Dr. Grayman will tell us a lot more about that. Eduardo Garcia is the mayor of Coachella. Mr. Garcia is a lifelong resident of the city of Coachella on the eastern side of the Coachella Valley. He graduated from Coachella Valley High School and attended the local College of the Desert prior to earning a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Riverside and a master's degree from USC. Mr. Garcia is in a fourth term as mayor of Coachella. Next, Ms. Christy Porter, who is the founder and executive director of Hidden Harvest. Christy is a former award-winning photojournalist and the founder of Hidden Harvest, a produce rescue or gleaning organization. Next, we have the mayor of Palm Springs, Mr. Steve Panier. Mr. Panier has been a resident of Palm Springs since 2001 and has served as an elected official since 2003 when he was first elected to the city council. Steve was elected mayor of Palm Springs in 2007 and has spearheaded a downtown revitalization plan and other programs, including a sustainability matters plan. So at this time, I would like to ask each panelist to tell us a little more about their organizations and what they are doing to build a healthier Coachella Valley. We'll start with you, Dr. Grayman. Thank you, Carolyn. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I get going as to framing this Coachella Valley, its upsides and its downsides in terms of improving health, I think it's important for me to lay out our pledges. Uh, Kay Hazen just did a very nice job laying out our first pledge from Desert Healthcare Foundation, and that is supporting in a big way the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, which is now operating in all schools, all public schools within the Coachella Valley, something that has not been done in the Alliance's history. But we have a second pledge from Desert Healthcare Foundation, and that is we have agreed to match $200,000 to a project that Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Pounier is going to tell you about uh, and which he briefly mentioned in the video. I also want to mention a third pledge, which is one from the Health Assessment Resource Center, what we affectionately known as HARC, an organization that does health needs assessments and helps determine quantitatively the exact status of health and social well-being in Eastern Riverside County and particularly in the Coachella Valley. We at HARC pledge to prov provide the necessary data 
to the Clinton Health Matters Initiative to analyze and interpret that data as requested and as required, and then to promulgate and present that data in forums such as this in hopefully meaningful ways so that we can see how we're doing as we as a community work to improve the health status of our residents. Now, you heard some in the video and you heard some from Kay Hazen that this community, this Coachella Valley ringed with mountains is not what it first seems when you land at Palm Springs Airport or when you walk outside your beautiful hotel room at the La Quinta Resort. There are huge income disparities as you witnessed in the video itself. But I want to point out some of the implications of that huge income disparity in terms of health status, which is what we're all here to talk about. If you look at children and you look at the parameter of a single, simple sounding question, but one that has been validated since the 1950s as an easy but important measure of overall health. And that is when we survey residents, we will ask the re adult respondent on the telephone to tell us about a child in their household. And we pose a question early on, how would you rate the health of this particular child on a four point scale? Excellent, good, fair, or poor. It sounds simplistic, but it is one of the best overall measures of health of a community. When you ask that question of residents of Western Coachella Valley, which I will define for these purposes as this building going west, the answer is 3% of children are rated by their parent or caregiver as either having fair or poor health. 3%. But if you ask that question of adult respondents about a child in their household, going from here eastward, let's say we go from here seven miles eastward into territory that Mayor Garcia knows quite well. You ask that same question, interestingly and unfortunately, that number goes from 3% to 21%, a seven-fold worsening. Now, if you ask that question about or two adults about their view of their own health status, now I'm going to talk not about geography so much as income of the household. If you ask that question of adults and the household has a income of greater than $75,000, which certainly many of our households do, the percentage of respondents who rate their own health as fair or poor is 75, I'm sorry, 7%. But if you ask the same question of households who, whose income is less than $25,000, that also goes up by a factor of seven. Instead of 7% self-rated fair or poor health, that number becomes 51%, over half of the residents in families and in households making less than $25,000 rate, rate their own health as fair or poor. Income makes a huge difference. Now we've analyzed the data using some statistical techniques to find out is the driving factor geography, is the driving factor ethnicity, since the great proportion of residents of the Eastern Coachella Valley are Latino, and the answer is no, those are not important drivers. The most important driver, perhaps no surprise, is income. Now, what happens when a household is making not enough dollars in 2013 to purchase health insurance for themselves and for their family? Well, again, I'm going to compare for the sake of discussion whites to Latinos in the entirety of Coachella Valley. But this is not so much a marker of ethnicity as it is a marker of income. And that is, what percentage of white adults in this larger community does not have health insurance in 2010 when we last measured? The answer is 10%. What percentage of Latino adults don't have health coverage? The answer is three and a half times greater, 36%. 
It goes on further. If people don't have health coverage, they can't get necessary preventative health screenings. So when you ask white women, have you ever in your life had a clinical breast examination, meaning a breast examination by a medical professional? 6% of white women say no. I have never had such a clinical breast examination. If you ask Latino women the same question, the answer is 23%, nearly four times greater. Nearly a quarter of Latino women in this community have never had their breasts checked by a healthcare professional, putting them at substantial risk for a lump which was not discovered and therefore breast cancer in their future. And I think one of the most egregious examples is if you ask men, white men, have you ever in your life, these are white men greater than 50, have you ever in your life had your prostate checked by the most rudimentary of evaluations, which is a digital rectal examination? If you ask white men, the answer is 12% of white men in this Coachella Valley, one in eight, have never had their prostate checked at all and they're greater than 50. But if you ask Latino men the same question, two-thirds, 65% of Latino men greater than 50 in this community have never had their prostate checked. What is their risk for having undetected prostate cancer, which becomes detected when it metastasizes and puts their health at serious jeopardy? I think I've probably taken up enough time, but we will talk together, I think, about some answers, about some approaches that we're now taking to address these disparities and address the overall health of the community. Mayor Garcia, I know that since I've been here, I've heard about a lot of the wonderful things you're doing in your city, Coachella, and then we heard this morning the superintendent talk about the iPads that are being provided for the students. Can you tell us some of the challenges that you're facing and some of the things that you're doing to improve the overall health of your community? Well, I'll begin by kind of setting the content here in terms of the demographics of our city. And it really kind of leads right into those numbers that uh, Dr. Grayman has just shared with us. Our city is over 60 years of uh, uh, old and incorporated. And uh, our demographics are about 98% Latino. The median age of our citizens is 24. We have 32 square miles of jurisdictional boundaries. And we have a city that is 80% undeveloped. So when we talk about the importance of health, we look at it from the standpoint of place. Uh, there was a lot of discussion earlier by Dr. David Satcher, who talked about the social uh, determinants of health and really leading to behavioral uh, implications, uh, really ultimately leading to the lack of options and good choices to live healthy. Uh, from our standpoint, and with the tremendous help and support of the California Endowment, who I believe two of our partners are here today, I wanna thank them uh, for being here and supporting our efforts in the city of Coachella and the eastern parts of Coachella Valley. We are looking at a problem such as child obesity, which those numbers were talked about early on by the president and the challenges that this country faces. But here in our own backyard, we see an opportunity by a development of a health element incorporated into our land use policies to begin addressing the issue from a preventative standpoint. Now, traditionally, uh, local government, I think, has seen its role in the area of providing police and fire services, picking up trash, making sure that the streets are cleaned up, and being reactionary to the issues that are pertaining to our residents and issues that affect the quality of life. Well, for me and for us at the city of Coachella and an effort uh, being put forward by building healthy communities connected to the California Endowment, we see the quality of life as the opportunity for our local government to step in and address the issues of health disparities that were just touched upon in the numbers that Dr. Grayman just shared with us. So the development of a health element will allow us to ensure that the built environment, the design of the community will be more conducive 
and encouraging to people who live in our community to be more physically active. Now, that means that we also have to ensure that our communities are safe. That also means that our communities must have access to transportation. That also means that our communities should have economic opportunities for our residents. You see, as recently as several weeks ago, I was talking to a resident who is extremely excited about the ongoing community engagement process that has taken place to develop this health element in our city. And he really brought it down to the basic fundamentals of health and well-being of people and families. And he says to me, Mayor, you want me, you want my family to move forward with this healthy lifestyle, uh, building healthy communities effort. But you know what I need, he says, is and I need a good paying job so that I have the ability and the state of mind to be able to provide for my family and ultimately have the opportunity to make those healthier choices. So we see this opportunity in land use and zoning to ensure that we are building and designing a community, not only that is sustainable, but that is also appealing, attractive for people to be more physically active. Now, we've set some aggressive goals uh, in that plan, uh, aside from wanting to double the amount of green acreage and park space in our community, uh, but making sure that we're conscientious in every decision that we make and asking ourselves a question, how will this impact the health of our community by making this decision? So I'm looking forward to the dialogue. I'm going to uh, give the floor to Ms. Christy Porter, but I'm certainly excited to be here. And I'll tell you, I was going to cross my leg right now like the doctor, but after the workout this morning, I, I, I was reminded <laughs> that I probably should just keep my feet on the ground here. So, <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Mayor Garcia. Christy, we've heard a lot already this morning about the importance that food, particularly fresh fruits and vegetables, play when in the uh, talking about healthy lifestyles, healthy communities. And when we think about fresh fruits and vegetables, access I is a real problem. I had an opportunity to visit one of our local senior center centers, uh, Mazelle Senior Center, and I was so impressed that there were actually fresh vegetables that were there for the seniors. So can you talk a little bit about your organization and how you actually bring the fresh fruits and vegetables to underserved communities? I can talk a little bit or I can talk a lot. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. And what a nice, uh, an, an honor to be on the panel here. Uh, Dr. Grayman, I know well and work with, and both my mayors. I live in Palm Springs and I work in Coachella, so I'm well represented up here. Hidden Harvest is a pro what we call a produce rescue organization. Probably you're not so familiar with that term, but perhaps you're familiar with the term gleaning. If you've read the Iliad recently or even the Book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Um, what you might not know, sitting here inside this beautiful resort, is that we are an enormous agriculture region here in the Coachella Valley. That smell of smoke in the air probably is not a fireplace going here at La Quinta, but it is hay bales that were set afire last night and helicopters hovered above the crops to keep them from freezing. We lost a lot of crops here last night. So we're an enormous, uh, enormous agriculture region. Um, I founded Hidden Harvest in 2001 in direct response to a query from a farm worker that I was uh, doing a project with. He's a father of two, and he's, we were building gardens in children's schools in Mecca. And he turned to me and he said, something's not right. He said, my wife and I work in the fields. And we, we pick food, and then we see food left unharvested, but we're not supposed to take it home. We're not supposed to pick it. And yet, you know, he says, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but sometimes my kids don't have enough to eat. And sometimes on the weekends, my wife and I skip our meals or we cut our meals in order for our kids to have enough. And yet I see all this food getting thrown away all the time, this beautiful, gorgeous produce, this life-giving this life-giving food. He said, what's up with that? 
What's the matter? Actually, he didn't say that. He said, you know what that tells me? That tells me that my family is not worth the garbage that you throw away. Your world is, that's the, that's the feedback to my kids, is that their health and their full stomachs are not worth what you're plowing under. He said, What's, why is that? And I said, I don't know. I was stunned. I said, I don't know, but I'll try to figure this out. Um, I like to fix things. I can't always. I almost never can. But this is the one thing it turns out that we could do something about. So I started meeting with farmers locally to say why had there never been uh, a successful gleaning organization in the Coachella Valley, this enormous agriculture region, second only to tourism in the amount of money, billions of dollars that it brings in. And so I said, why can't there be a gleaning organization here? So that was 2001. So now, 12 years later, we've brought in over 14 million pounds of produce from the fields that would have otherwise been plowed under, and we've delivered it all free of charge to agencies that serve the poor and the hungry. We now serve, we have a new exciting partnership with our local Feeding America affiliate, Fine Food Bank. And so we're able to team with them and their expertise, not only in, in food, but in delivery to make the maximum out of all the produce that we can serve. And now we're reaching over 80,000 people a month, probably more. Lisa's out there, she could tell me the numbers. But probably more with this new partnership. So why was all this waste? What was it all for? Why is it there? The USDA says that 27% of all produce grown for human consumption, not sod and not you know ethanol, but for hu human consumption is left in the field. Sometimes it's frost like today or freeze. Sometimes it's uh, cosmetic blemishes. We are a picky consumer country. We won't eat a cauliflower that's not bright white that has a little yellow spot. We won't eat a pepper that has a blemish spot on the side. Sometimes it just grows too big for the box. We have cauliflower that just, they just kind of get overactive. They're too big for the box. They can't, they can't fit, so they leave them in the field. And sometimes it's the competition from Mexico or other countries, and the market price falls too low locally, and it doesn't pay our farmers to pick them. So our, really, our pledge, in part, to Everybody in the Coachella Valley, not just to the Clinton Foundation, but to our fantastic partners at Desert Healthcare District and, and Kathy, I see her over there, and, and also Kay and Glenn. Our pledge to you is to keep showing up every day and looking for more and more produce. Our pledge to find, and Lisa, wherever she is, if she's here, is that we're pledge a million pounds or more to you. Hopefully it's a lot more in the year ahead. And our pledge to the endowment, our great partners, the California Endowment and Building Healthy Communities, is to keep showing up, keep harvesting produce. We're even going to grow it ourselves next year. Pro produce is getting the demand for it. People are getting the message. Food banks are getting the message. Small pantries are getting the message. The product that you have is life-giving. The product that you have makes people feel loved. We do these senior markets that Carolyn was talking about where we roll out carts. Well, you saw them in the film earlier. Roll out carts of this produce and senior in Section 8 housing. And seniors come and shop, only all the shopping is free. So it gets them out in the air. They meet their neighbors. They, uh, and they have choice, fantastic choice. They can go down the line and pick what they want, not some bag all tied up that somebody else chose for them. So we pledge to you that we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep coming up with creative ways uh, to make produce flow like a river. And our personal pledge, my personal pledge, in addition to having lost 22 pounds so far, but and I've, my partner, I wanted to do it for her and for me, but my personal pledge to the Clinton Foundation and great appreciation for all they've done is to uh, re-implement my second career, my first career. I'm in my second one now. I'm very lucky to have survived the almost death of journalism and found something else to do. But my original job was a, a photojournalist. I started out in Kentucky, my native planet, and moved around. So we pledged that we're going to be telling the visual story of Coachella Valley's particular both health problems and health successes in the years to come. And this visual story will be in the form of small, very short films that tell the story from our perspective. 
and they will be available to council members and council meetings and hospitals and websites that need it. They will be not proprietary, but hopefully we'll find a way using all of our Coachella people, our Coachella Valley people to tell their own story to make a difference. So, there you go. Christy, thank you. <laughs> Mayor Pouye, as a new resident to the Coachella Valley and to Palm Springs, you and I have had an opportunity to discuss the community, some of the disparities, some of the things that you're working on. So could you please share with the audience some of the things that you're working on as the mayor of Palm Springs? Yeah, and first, Carolyn, uh, and I'm delighted that you're a resident. I forgot to tell you, there are rattlesnakes in the Mesa. So Now you tell me. I know. So uh, I'm delighted to, to be on the panel. And the first thing, this is the only panel you know that's got two elective officials on it. So if you need to get water or a snack or anything like that, we'll still be here talking. Don't, don't worry about it. We do have a countdown clock. No, there is. So. Don't worry. There, there, there is a clock. I don't know how I, I follow uh, Christy, but I will uh, certainly try. And the other thing, even though Eduardo and I are here representing Coachella and Palm Springs, uh, there are a lot of our colleagues from the other cities that are also doing really creative things within their cities when it comes to activity and wellness. And so I, I certainly want to give a shout out um, uh, to our colleagues. Uh, I'm going to do a couple things. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, Carolyn, specifically what we are doing uh, in the city of Palm Springs. It's been very methodical, and I, and I want to talk about that. And then third, uh, or second, I do want to talk exactly about uh, the pledge and the commitment uh, that we are making and uh, that Glenn briefly uh, uh, talked about. And the theme I hope that you get from, from my talk is in, in, in a community, and especially Palm Springs, this, this wellness and the activity and sustainability, it doesn't work just because it's the mayor saying, let's do this. Because when you start asking, oh, it's, what's the role of the government? What are they doing? We, the theme is a bottom-up approach. And that's how we've done it in the city of Palm Springs. When the president this morning mentioned and introduced uh, uh, Carter, uh, it got me to thinking, what, why did I want to take the city in this direction of being active in, 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 in wellness and, and making it part of what we do and integrate it into everything that we do in the city of Palm Springs. When I was a council member back in 2006, uh, there was an eighth grader in town. Wasn't mayor, became mayor in 2007. And I, I always run around to the high schools and do push-up contests with the principals and all those kind of things. And, and he said, I know you're going to run for, for mayor, Steve. And he said, Can, can't you do something um, about the environment, uh, about health and wellness? Um, can't you please, please? I know you believe in it. And I am very passionate about it. I, I live and breathe to run in my exercise. It is meditating. It, is, it's, it just clears your thoughts. So the first thing that I did when I was elected in 2007, I signed the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. And it was... You know, it was just to send a message to the community that we cared about our environment, we cared about our health in our community. And that's, that's what, what started the city of Palm Springs on its road to where we are um, today. And as, as I mentioned before, so, so what did we do? Uh, I formed a commission of citizens. There are so many people in our communities that are so active, that want to be involved, and sometimes you just need to find that role. So we, we formed uh, a sustainability commission, which could be a sustainability and wellness commission. 11, 11 members from our, our community to help guide us and guide me on what we need to do. This commission formulated with me and my city council a sustainability wellness master plan. So we took the master plan. We debated it. And we passed it, because it would be now integrated into everything we do, the review of the general plan, you name it. This was something that, that we were going to do. And the biggest question that I got, remember, this was early in 2008. As you know, the markets weren't doing well. Government started losing property tax revenue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm going to come back to this theme at the end. 
How do you fund something like that? You just don't take a half million dollars out of the general fund to, to fund your wellness and your sustainability issues. That would not go over very well in the public. At this time, our waste management contract was up for bid. We arranged the waste management contract to allow a steady stream of about a half a million dollars to flow into our sustainability fund. So and that was very, very, very key for people to really to buy in to what we are doing. So, so long after I'm gone, there is money there. We, we established an office of sustainability who's we're now working on wellness issues, and, and, and we started to, to move forward. But again, the city can't do this. So, so I convened uh, a meeting uh, in the city of the healthcare uh, district, Desert Regional, the water agency, uh, both county supervisors, and, and had them to a meeting. They're not all sure what they were coming to. Okay, nice, nice dinner at the, at the museum. And I talked about my plans in Palm Springs, that this has got to be a body. I need this to happen within your organization. This is how it will work. It will, it, the veins will trickle out and we will become this healthier, sustainable city, which, as the president mentioned this morning, is all tied to economic development, as Eduardo had mentioned. They are, they are, all, they are all absolutely um, uh, related. So, so they actually signed a pledge, a resolution, that they would partner with the city. They became, I like to call it, it's my leadership council, where we still meet quarterly to review what they are doing in their organizations. And I could go on and on and on and talk about all of the things that are happening at the Healthcare District or Desert Regional or the Desert Water Agency and all the organizations because they are, they are living and breathing uh, the document. And, and that has spawned an uh, incredible amount of things that's happening in the, in the city of Palm Springs. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go through everything that we're doing in the city, uh, but we now have an edible uh, landscape plan. We have incentivized um, homeowners and HOAs to build their own uh, gardens. We now have four, actually, gardens at four schools in Palm Springs. These are different than community gardens. We did get our neighborhood involvement group. We now have every neighborhood looking for community gardens so they can grow their own uh, their own food. We have a uh, healthy living sustainability series. And my point is that the, what we do is, is year-round. It's not something we just do in the fall, we do in the spring, but we do it, we do it year-round. Yes, ma'am. So last year, when I was here, one of the things I wanted to do was find a way <coughs> to create a festival, to do something. Uh, more community-wide. And so last year, we had the first Mayor's um, Healthy You, Healthy Planet Race and Wellness Festival. As you all know, the president is, is very convincing. Uh, we raised $110,000 net, <coughs> net profit, again, thanks to a match uh, from the Healthcare Foundation. The president delivered a speech on childhood obesity. Moving, compelling, and I'm proud to say that, that the proceeds, $110,000, went directly to the Alliance for a Healthy Generation Child Obesity Program that Kay Hazen talked about and that's been spoken about here, here today. So and again, of course, last year at the conference, um, as the president mentioned again, he, he's challenged us as local stakeholders, communities, to help find the answers. And so on December the 6th, many of you know, the Clinton Health Matters Initiative held a workshop here uh, in the desert to identify strategies that are going to be funded by the Clinton Health Matters Initiative. Uh, I am very, very proud to say, uh, as Glenn mentioned, uh, I went to the board of the Desert Health Care Foundation. Uh, they agreed to match up to, to $200,000 uh, with the recent uh, generous donation from Desert Regional. I can tell you right now uh, that $400,000 has been met, and the commitment is that that money that seed money will go directly to fund the strategies coming out of December 6, which will be public in early February, of the Clinton Health Matters Initiative. At least $400,000 immediately in that pot to spend on health and wellness programs here in Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley. Commitment number one. <coughs> Commitment number two, 
which will surprise my city manager a little bit and the staff that's here, but we're gonna we're now gonna take our sustainability master plan and we're gonna review it and actually formally include health and wellness in the sustainability master plan, which gets driven right into the general plan and everything that we do. So I commit that the city of Palm Springs is now gonna create the health component of our master plan sustainability. And then third, the festival is moving in 2014 to be a primary anchor fundraiser before the weekend before the Humana Golf Tournament. And we are going to commit that it will be bigger, it will be better, and we will raise more money that goes directly to the Clinton Health Matters initiatives here in Palm Springs in the Coachella Valley. So those are our three commitments. Carolyn. Thank, thank you. Thank you for those of you who participate in our polling question, and I will give you the answer now. Uh, the answer is 50 million. So more than 50 million Americans go without high value preventative services for basic health care. And that's pretty remarkable because those of us that are in the healthcare industry, we realize what happens is when people don't get preventative health care, they utilize the emergency room. And unfortunately, when they show up in the emergency room because they haven't had preventative care, something that maybe could have been treated in a primary care office is now much more severe. At this time, we would like to entertain questions from the audience. Do I see any hands? Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dwayne Proctor. I'm with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm in charge of our childhood obesity programs and strategies for the nation. Um, Ms. Porter, I've talked to you a couple of times. I'm always inspired by the work you do, and um, it's great that um, this is still continuing. Uh, my question, though, is for the politicians in particular. I'm interested in um, what sources of information uh, did you use to um, get, get inspired to do what you've done uh, so far in your efforts to prevent childhood obesity. I don't know uh, if you're using some of the tools that we've developed, like the Healthy Communities, Healthy Futures website, or um, some of the other tools that are out there. Or, or, I have an or question for you. The or question is, are you measuring reductions in childhood obesity as a part of your work, or are you using community economic development as your major metric of success? Thank you. I, I can uh, take that question, and I think it begins with the stubborn facts, right? Those facts, those stubborn things that uh, when you look at the rates of child obesity, which then translates to the rates of people suffering diabetes, I think that in itself is a reason to react. Now, uh, we have been, again, fortunate to have the California Endowment and the Building Healthy Communities effort in our city and in the eastern parts of the Coachella Valley that has uh, brought about the resources and the tools to engage the community, uh, for the community to themselves identify these disparities and begin to develop plans of action. Very organic grassroots efforts, such as implementing the first farmer's market that uh, ever has uh, been in operation in the eastern parts of the Coachella Valley. Uh, beginning to incorporate uh, walking uh, events and activities uh, within organizations, the school districts, um, and very simple tools, right, to begin that effort. But now, from a city standpoint, we're looking at the bigger picture and how it is that we plan the future of our city. I mentioned earlier that it is 80% undeveloped, which uh, really is 16,000 acres of undeveloped land, much of it being agriculture, uh, use, but we want to make sure that the future development of our community is health conscientious. That way we can address the child obesity from a preventative standpoint. Now, that is our pledge, uh, the adoption of the health element that will lead to health and wellness, capital improvement, and programmatic activities. And uh, we will begin to measure those outcomes as the general plan is adopted of course, with the health element included this June of 2013. So we are on our way 
to beginning the implementation phases. But I think more importantly, the fact that we're having this conversation here in the Coachella Valley about the health inequities that exist is extremely important because two, three, four years ago, I think we all just overlooked the fact that from a certain boundary west, uh, there's just a different quality of life for folks. And if you move east, then the circumstances are different and the life expectancies and health outcomes are much different. Uh, you heard Dr. Grayman talking about the numbers, uh, disparities in terms of access, in terms of care. Um, and so I can appreciate the fact that we're having this conversation collectively as the Coachella Valley and now having foundations uh, such as the one that's sponsoring this event, foundations like yourselves, as well as the California Endowment, help assisting us in facilitating that process. But uh, that's where we currently stand. And I truly believe that we, being the youngest population in the Coachella Valley as a city, will truly change the way the next generation looks at health uh, in this country and, of course, in this Coachella Valley. And just, ju just quickly, I mean, answer both, both parts of that. The passion part. Health and wellness, it's just always been a passion. Uh, my partner and I didn't have children. And when the passion grew is we now have seven-year-old twins. So I just started paying a little bit more attention on what's happening when you go to a birthday party, a, sec a second or a third, you know, they're two or three years old and you see little kids grabbing a soda. Something like that. I mean, this happens. We know that it happens. It shouldn't happen. So, so my passion grew once, A, we had kids, started to understand the problem, which the president so well laid out last year. Now, the, the measurement tool, as Kay Hazen uh, mentioned, what the Alliance for Healthier Generation is doing, which has been funded by the Heart Association, the Clint Foundation, is measuring childhood obesity uh, here in, in the Coachella Valley. And there are measurements to hold us accountable for what we're doing. If, if I can jump in uh, specifically, there's a number, I presented a number of problems in the Coachella Valley, but there's a number of advantages of us working here. And I see some nodding heads. Uh, one of them, straight to your point, is measurement. This nonprofit, HARC, the Health Assessment Resource Center, founded in 2006, was designed to do exactly what you're suggesting. It's often been said you can't improve anything unless you can measure it. And you have measurement tools. HARC has a very local measurement tool in that we survey this community every three years, publish a report, allow people to search that report online. That report goes on for roughly 700 pages, but it's very searchable. And so not only childhood obesity numbers, we will be able, we now have, from 2007 and the 2010 HARC survey, we now have two points in time. And as of last week, we've begun our 2013 survey. We will have three points in time. As the Affordable Care Act goes into effect next year, we will have a three-point baseline as to what changes that might bring, hopefully improvements. And in 2016, we'll be remeasuring. Uh, those of you who might be interested, harkdata.org is where you can search this thing. One other point, if I may, because we're running short on time. Many of us have talked about various solutions to the problems we face locally. Those solutions may or may not be generalizable. Uh, to the rest of you in the nation. But I want to point out one that we've really taken great advantage of in the last few years in particular. And that's the concept of what we call collective impact. You are very familiar from Robert Johnson with the concept of collective impact. That is, I think, we think at Desert Healthcare District that funders have a unique opportunity beyond calling for grant applications assessing those applications, and writing grant checks. We believe when organizations come to a funder, such as ourselves, perhaps you, I, I can't speak for your organization, we are now increasingly saying, well, wait a minute. We're not ready to fund you yet. What other entities within this community are doing similar work? 
you get together with those organizations, those nonprofits, those governmental agencies, you work a collaboration and come back to us. We will fund preferentially that collaboration. When we do that, we are now seeing enhanced progress. We are seeing that the whole is greater than the sum of each of its parts. Um, we're gratified that we're able to do that. When we have problems, and we have, uh, Christy is aware, others are aware, when we have problems with two organizations that could be competing or could be collaborating, we offer, if you will, mediation services. We did one yesterday in which we bring the parties together and we say, how can we work this out so that the community is better off? And given that we're giving away millions of dollars and hopefully there is some ongoing respect in addition to the money we give, we have their attention, we have their respect, and they're willing to come together, break down silos and barriers for the collective impact which is making such progress in this community. And I hope that is something that's generalizable everywhere in this country. As our time is, is drawing to a close, um, and as we end, I think the one thing that we've heard a lot today about accessibility, about disparities, and I think the Coachella Valley is a perfect example of how even though there are several cities in the community, the community really comes together to address these issues. And so with the few seconds we have left, I don't know if anyone on the panel really wants to address that collaboration and what that has meant to accessibility and eliminating some of those disparities in our community. I'd, I'd like to touch on a conversation that has been ongoing for several years now as we talk about collaboration and the sustainability of being able to provide the, not only technical assistance, but the resources to move this agenda forward. And uh, that is the concept of the health district that exists in the western parts of the Coachella Valley. Something that I think as we continue this discussion, we will begin to outline the possibilities of ensuring that this entire region is covered by some type of health care district or another to continue to move the opportunities to build, support, and ultimately make the Coachella Valley equally a healthy place for everyone to live. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank our panel, and hopefully we've been able to put a local spotlight on the Coachella Valley. We'd also like to thank the Clinton Foundation for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>